chapter 4 of Genesis, which is so interesting in itself, is that this chapter is known by people who study Genesis, and especially this chapter, as the chapter of first, F-I-R-S-T-S, just the word first. It's known as the chapter of first. And it's because we have so many first occurrences in the chapter. I'll give you a list of these, some of them if you want to write them down. We have the first pregnancy. Now, there's no other chapter in Scripture like this one for first. We have the first pregnancy, the first birth, the first brothers, the first sacrifice, the first murder, the first human lie told, of course, by Cain. He said he didn't know where, where his brother was. Adam and Eve didn't lie in chapter 3. They just passed the buck, which is just as bad as far as God's concerned. The first city. Where in the world do these people get the idea of men living in caves and beating each other over the head with sticks and grunting and groaning at one another? <laughs> that doesn't come until after Genesis 4 if you don't realize that that happens but that doesn't happen until after Genesis 4 so there's no such thing in the Bible as evolution as I've said many times it's devolution man has gotten worse not gotten better but you've got to understand that I mean we can look just at this century just the last few decades look at the, invention, the inventions that we've seen popping one after another I mean you don't see people going to the moon back in the Old Testament days like we see now. So it would appear from a superficial glance that man must be evolving. He's getting better. He's getting smarter. Things are working out better for him. And of course, the evolutionists think they've got a good case just by pointing us to our own history. But uh, we'll see later on. That doesn't really work out. What I say, first city, we've got people living in cities already. Now, it doesn't mean empire state building type construction but it means a formal gathering of people together in, in one geographical region, not living in a cave or in a swamp or something. And I mean, after all, I couldn't build a city. Could you build a city? Let's say you've got to build a city in comparison to the cities that exist today. He had to build one in comparison to those that existed then. I couldn't, I wouldn't know where to start on beginning to build a city. So how in the world can we say that somehow we've evolved better from these men? That fellow could build a city there. <laughs> and you've got to have some type of engineer degree today to know where to begin on that. Another first, we have the first polygamist, the first tent makers, the first herdsmen, the first musicians, the first artificer, the first artificer is in verse 22, the first poet, the first poetry, the first braggart, braggart, poster, and the first revival, revival, the last verse, the last phrase. Now, that's a lot of things to cover there in chapter 4. This is why we're giving the posterity and genealogy here of Lamech, because we see even through old pagan Lamech here, who, have, who is a descendant of Cain. Oh, by the way, if you'll look over in uh, 1 John 3, I don't want you to think we've got anything personally against Cain. It's just that the Bible has something against Cain just as the Bible has something against Esau. People don't like to read Hebrews, Hebrews uh, what is that, chapter 12, because it looks like God's being unfair to Esau there. And that doesn't even take into account Malachi 1 and Romans 9. That's just there in Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, 1 John 3, well, verse 11. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Well, does that sound like a good description of Cain? No, he says not as Cain, who was of that wicked one. Remember Genesis 3:15, the seed of the wicked one? Who was of that wicked one and slew his brother? And wherefore slew him? 
because his own works were evil and his brothers righteous. That's what we said earlier in the message. That he gave an offering, but the Bible calls that an evil offering because it didn't meet those two conditions that I gave you earlier. And his brothers righteous. We saw that in Hebrews 11, verses uh, 3 and 4 there. Verse 4 of Hebrews 11. So the Bible calls Cain a descendant of that wicked one. That's why Cain is not looked upon as one in Scripture whom we should emulate or follow in his steps. But going back to Genesis 4, uh, verses 19 through 24, here's where we see the things that I mentioned, such as your polygamists, tent makers, herdsmen, musician, artificer, poet, poetry, and braggart, all in those verses. Now you see, Lamech is our second murderer, or the second recorded one. Cain has killed his brother Abel, and now Lamech has killed someone. He says he murdered someone in verse 23, and he's married to these two women. That makes him a polygamist. This is poetry in the Hebrew. This is our first poetry in the Bible, is uh, Genesis chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. That makes him our first poet, but in his poetry, he's bragging on the fact. Well, if God likes Cain so much that he's going to protect him so that if anyone takes revenge on him, he's going to recompense to the revenger sevenfold, then to me it's going to be 77-fold because he said, I'm a lot better than Cain. I mean, that's what we have today. People brag on their evil deeds. That's what Lamech is doing. He's bragging on his evil deeds. Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, and hearken unto my speech. I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. You see, this is Hebrew poetry. That's why it's a little bit difficult to understand. And if Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then he says, I'm much better than Cain. I'm a worse criminal than Cain. Truly, Lamech, seventy and sevenfold. So there we have our first boaster that's bragging. And then we end the chapter with at least a minor revival in the end of verse 26. Okay, Genesis chapter 5, the first of the two most important genealogies in Genesis. The other one, of course, is in chapter 11. We have in this chapter a list of six men who attained to the age or above the age of 900. And these men are Adam, lives to be 930. Seth lives to be 912. Enos, he was born back in the last verse of chapter 4. Enos lives to be 905. Cainan, verse 12, lives to be 910. Jared, in verse 20, lives to be 962. That makes him the second oldest man that ever lived. And who's the last one? Methuselah, 969, verse 27. Adam, Seth, Enos, Cainan, Jared, and Methuselah, 969. Now, you might have noticed from the names that we read in chapter 4, some of these names appear to be similar. Uh, some of them are exactly the same. We have an Enoch in chapter 3. We have an, I mean, chapter 4. We have an Enoch in chapter 5. We have uh, Methuselah and a name that's very similar to that back in chapter 4, but these are different individuals. Remember that these aren't the same individuals. And that brings us down to verse 28. We have another Lamech here. And Lamech lived 180 and two years. I believe that makes him... Well, what, what would that be? That's the third oldest as far as when he first gave birth. That's right. He's the third oldest as far as whenever his uh, parentalhood begins, Lamech would be. Lamech lived in 180 and two years. Uh, Methuselah and Noah would, of course, have been above him. And begat a son. And he called his name Noah, saying, This thing shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. And Lamech lived after he begat Noah five, 590 and five years, begat sons and daughters, Lamech lived to be 777, and Noah was 500 years old, 
and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now we gave you six names there in chapter 5 of men who attained to above the age of 900. Who's the seventh man? There's only seven in Scripture. Who's the seventh man that attains to an age above 900? I can't hear up here. Noah. Noah lived to be 950. That makes Noah the third oldest man. Behind, of course, Methuselah and Jared. Methuselah was 969 and Jared was 962. And Noah, we see, lived to be 600 years and we have the flood. And the scriptures say that he lived after the flood 350 years, which makes Noah 950 years old. So we have seven men that lived to be above the age of 900. Noah was the oldest man as far as when his uh, parental hood began, that is, whenever he first gave birth, and that was a half a millennium. He was 500 years old when he became a father. We've got several messages here on the genealogies in the other class, so we'll skip over the genealogies. Genesis chapter 6, 7, and 8, we have the great deluge. Chapters 6, 7, and 8 all go together. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. Second time we see God's spirit mentioned in Scripture. So already we have a hint of a plurality in the Godhead, not counting other things that uh, we've skipped over. The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants, Nephilim, in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. Now that verse is a crucially important verse. Not for the reason that you might think it is either. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Well, I thought Numbers 23, 19 says God's not a man that he should repent. God says, says here that it repented the Lord. The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me twice now that I have made them. And here's the first time we see the most, one of the most beautiful words in the Bible, what saved you, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The first time the word grace appears in Scripture. Now we begin a new Toledot in verse 9. These are the Toledot of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. You think that Christians today believe in the doc doctrine of Christian perfection? Not on your life. But this is Old Testament. And God was already commanding them to be perfect and to be mature and sincere and upright in their life. Well, that's Matthew 5, 48. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So that is all introductory material to the great deluge. In verses 14 through 22 now, we have God's instructions to Noah, his initial instructions to Noah concerning the building of the ark. Verses 14 through 22. He gives later instructions in chapter 7. But these contain the initial instructions that God gives to Noah concerning the building of the ark. Quickly give you the dimensions of the ark, taking the cubit as 18 inches, which is debatable, but that's in between the debate 
the 17 and the 21 inches. It's at least in between. We have a length of 450 feet. Now, this is a huge, huge structure. A breadth of 75 feet and a height of 45 feet. Now, how, how long is a football field? How many feet is a football field? 300 feet. Now, you think how long a football field is. If you've ever had to run a 100-yard dash, you know what it's like running a football field. This thing is 150 feet longer than a football field. It's a huge structure. I mean, it's a tremendous structure. This is what people have to keep in mind when they're studying about Noah putting all those animals in that silly little boat. This is a huge, immense structure. 150 feet, it's a football field and half again. That's how big the thing is. I mean, you could put, uh, you could put a lot of mice in something like that. And all he needed was two. Yeah, but how did he get all those things to come in there, though? Did he bait them, you know, how you put the bait out there and get them in there and slam the door behind them? How did he get all those animals in there? Tell you. <laughs> I will later on. Chapter 7. We have the flood beginning, down in verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life. I mean, the Bible just makes these statements and expects us to believe them. 600th year. And so I don't argue. Just take it for what it says here. In the 600th year of Noah's life, the second month, the 17th day of the month, looked like they kept up with days and months and years because we see all three of them in one verse there, which is interesting. The same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. In the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. They and every beast after his kind, all the cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. So let me give you a brief chronology of the flood, which will take us on through chapter 8. And this is based upon the years of Noah. In Noah's 600th year, the second month, the 17th day. Otherwise, you get confused on all these days and months that are mentioned here. The flood began. Noah's 600th year, the second month, the 17th day. The flood began. Third month, 27th day. The rain stopped. Rains, quote, unquote, stopped. Forty days later, obviously. The seventh month, the 17th day, the top of the first mountain is seen. The tenth month, the first day, Tops of other mountains are seen. The eleventh month, the eleventh day, eleventh month, eleventh day, I'll go back in a moment. He sends forth the raven and the dove. The eleventh month, the eighteenth day, the dove is sent out for the second time. 11th month, 25th day, the dove sent out for the third time. Then we go into Noah's 601st year, the first month, the first day. Noah removed the covering of the ark. And then finally, the second month and the 27th day, the earth is completely dry, which gives us a total of around 370 days. 
which is, of course, more than a year. Okay, I need to repeat any of those. Second month, 17th day. Third month, 27th day. Seventh month, 17th day. Tenth month, first day. Eleventh month, 11th day. Eleventh month, 18th day. Eleventh month, 25th day. First month, first day. Second month, 27th day. That takes us all the way through chapter 8 and verse 14. In the second month of the seven and twentieth day of the month was the earth dry. And so here we have a completion of both the prevailing and the assuaging of the waters upon the earth during the great deluge. Verses 15 through 22, we have the first mentioning of an altar being built in Scripture, Noah building an, offer, an altar, offering sacrifice to the Lord, in thanksgiving and appreciation for the preservation of his life. That's verses 15 through 22, the first mentioning of an altar built in Scripture. Okay, chapter 9, the first 17 verses, we have what's known as the Noachian Covenant. The Noachian Covenant. N-O-A-C-H-I-A-N. The Noachian Covenant. Then verses 18 to 29, we have a very interesting curse on Ham and his descendants and a blessing on Shem and Japheth. which, by the way, you'll find to be very interesting when we get to that because we today are experiencing the blessing that's recorded in these verses, verses 18 to 29, that I uh, dare say most Christians don't realize that. But a very interesting curse placed upon Ham or specifically, of course, placed upon Canaan, which uh, appears to be his fourth-born son, as we'll see in chapter 10. Ham's fourth-born son was Canaan, his first-born was Cush. But then we see a blessing upon Shem and a blessing upon Japheth. Chapter 10 is known as the Table of Nations. And here we begin another Toledot. And these are the Toledot of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So in, in all your readings and studies you do that have any content to them, you'll find Genesis chapter 10 is the Table of Nations. Most of these... 40 or so names mentioned here in chapter 10 have to do more with nations and cultures than they do individuals. So just remember that. These names have to do more with nations and cultures than they do with actual individuals. Although we can have individuals actually named Canaan, as we certainly did, the implication and what he wants us to see from these names being mentioned is that they were a beginning of a people and not an isolated individual. Not even going to look at that because it's just so much material there and so many names, but we have the beginning of, of nations there. Then we have chapter 11. Let's see, the first nine verses, the Tower of Babel. Chapter 11, the first nine verses, the Tower of Babel, and a city that's built, of course, along with it. And chronologically, these first nine verses, well, even more verses than that in chapter 11, fit into chapter 10. Chapter, the whole, the entirety of chapter 11, in other words, does not immediately follow chapter 10 chronologically. Chapter 11 is kind of mixed in after uh, several generations in chapter 10. And then the final thing, we've got verses 10 through 32. 10 through 32, which give us two more of our Toledot. In verse 10, the Toledot of Shem. In verse 27, the Toledot of Terah.
If you'll go down to verse 27, we'll read these verses and that'll wrap it up tonight and introduce us to the great patriarch Abraham that we'll begin looking at next time. The Toledot of Shem is in verse, beginning with verse 10. The Toledot of Terah, verse 27. Genesis 11:27. Now these are the Toledot of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. So that, of course, makes Lot Abram's nephew. And Haran died before his father, Terah, the land of his nativity, in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram, Abram's wife was Sarai. The name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. And all these names though, will become significant later on. And Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. They came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Let me see if I can find that on a map here, and I'll show that to you while you're finishing up. I might have one that shows all that on here. Well, this is close enough. To give you some idea exactly where they're going, this will be familiar to some of you, some of you it won't be. Now here we have, of course, Palestine. Doesn't show up the best, but you can see the general direction. Here we have Palestine. This is where, of course, Abram is eventually going to come in chapter 12. You see Ur... This is the land of the Chaldeans. just another name for the Babylonians. This is, of course, desert land. This is why any time in Scripture it talks about Israel's enemies coming from the north, it doesn't necessarily mean someone right up here. The enemies that come from the north also come from over here because they can't come across this desert. They're, this is known as the Fertile Crescent or Mesopotamia. This is all fertile land here. That's why they're going to have to come up this way and then come down. This is exactly what Abram does. And uh, Terah, his father, they leave Ur, they go up here to Haran. And they stay there and sojourn there for a while. And then in chapter 12 and uh, verse 5, we'll see Abram leaving Haran and coming down here to the land of Canaan, which is this area. So that'll give you an idea in your mind. You see here's, uh, well, this is the Babylonian Empire down here. This becomes later on the Assyrian Empire up here. We have, uh, well, we've got... Um, uh, cities such as Nineveh and Babylon, of course, that will become important later on in Scripture. You see Ur of the Chaldees mentioned several times. So you need to know where it is. We've got a famous battle that fought at uh, Carchemish. We'll see that later on in the book of Acts. We did our studying over here. You see here's the island of Cyprus. So all this is in the same general area. It's simply they were a little further east over this direction. Went up here to Haran, down to Canaan. Okay, any questions on that? I think we'll stop there because we'll pick up with the uh, history of Abraham beginning next time. Praise the Lord. Then. Great is the Lord, Psalm 48. Oh, no. 
complete list of Brother Ross's tapes and books, please write 